Good morning and welcome to WEP on Air. My name is Michelle Ponto. I work at Kaus Communications here. And I'm here today with David Edwards, who is, an, who is a creator, writer, and educator from Harvard University. He's also the founder and director of Love Laboratoire in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I've been doing a lot of research on you before the interview, and your work includes new approaches to treating infectious diseases, new ways of eating, new ways of cleaning the air with plants, and new ways of learning. A lot of this has to do with the cross-pollination of science and art. Tell me a little bit about this. Why is, why is this cross-pollination important, and why is it something that you bring into your work? Thank you. Yeah, actually, this cross-pollination of art and science is really at the origin of the intellectual enterprise of humanity going back thousands of years. Over the last few hundred years, um, related to the explosion of knowledge uh, consequent to the Newtonian revolution, actually, there's been this specialization of knowledge, uh, which has led to what used to be a unified process of creativity that was part of our organizations of going back to the early Greeks has been separated now in uh, our institutions of learning, our institutions of production, and our institutions of governance. And so if you look at creativity uh, as a mental process, you see that there are two phenomena that merge in the minds of, of creators. One is a imaginative, inductive, open-ended process that we associate with art, and the other is a deductive, analytical, problem-solving process that we associate with science. Creators faced with new opportunities merge those two naturally, and so what we've done in the last 15 years in my work, and now increasingly in work in other labs and other, other uh, organizations in Europe and, and throughout the world has been to bring those two processes back and to create institutions where we can create in the way that is most associated with the most enduring works of art and science of our, of our times. Okay. I know you originally started your, your laboratory in uh, Paris, but you had moved it to Cambridge because it was more conducive to um, the cross-pollination of science and art. Why is it? Why are certain cities a little bit more receptive to this natural emergence of the two, two disciplines together? So it's interesting. If you look today, for example, there's a few cities and regions that are particularly rich in uh, both the learning that's associated with creativity, the experimentation that's associated with production, and ultimately the producing itself. Silicon Valley is a, obviously kind of the the place in the world today for information technology uh, with Stanford playing this role of learning hub with the Valley this role of experimental hub and with companies like Apple and IBM as this sort of production hub in New York City in the context of Broadway theater we have New York University off Broadway Broadway in Boston we have universities like MIT and Harvard biotech startups and then companies like Biogen and, and most of the major pharmaceutical companies in the world. If you look at the culture of uh, creation, you find that there are always three separate and viable value centers. One is a learning center, one is this experimental center where we're sort of paid to fail, and a third is a production center where we bring the value that's generated in learning, that's honed in experimentation to, to the public. The, the secret of those communities is more than the value that's provided by a Stanford University or the startups in the Valley or an IBM. It's this incredible culture that allows for ideas and people to move from one center to the next to the next with no essentially perceived conflict of interest. And that's a fragile uh, culture. And so we find that some cities in history have had a, a period where that culture exists and for reasons that can relate to war, that can relate to 
a disequilibrium often associated with the mere success of production. Uh, there can be a disequilibrium between these three centers and we can lose that culture pretty easily. And so Paris, uh, 100 years ago was a, a, a mecca really for uh, art and science and, 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 uh, and the frontiers of knowledge, clearly affected by, uh, by the war um, and, and, uh, and similarly with uh, uh, centers uh, back to the uh, uh, ancient times. Okay. So it sounds like, the, the, like you said, the balance is very fragile. Is the balance also taken to play the, the types of people that live there? For example, if there are too many artists and not enough of the science technology people, that balance won't be there. Or if there's too much tech finance and not enough of the, the traditional artists, that balance won't be there? Is yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think that the, the coming back to this issue of these three centers, the most typically what is uh, disequilibrating this this fragile uh, uh, culture is a, an over-reliance on the uh, production, uh, whether it's a, a financial production or a technological production. It can lead to a uh, lowering of the value of learning and of experimentation. And so we find in, uh, in education, for example, in the United States right now, a um, challenge in valuing the artistic process in education only because there's so much value which is associated with uh, technological learning and technological production. And, and uh, there's a big kickback right now to try and bring the arts back into, uh, into learning, uh, precisely related to the kinds of issues that I'm describing right now. So yes, there's a kind of a natural equilibrium which is pretty fundamental to uh, to society. It's not something that we really need to, it's not like we need to ship artists to uh, to Silicon Valley to uh, in increase the uh, kind of creative potential of the valley. It, there's a kind of a natural equilibrium that, that generates itself um, uh, simply by nature of uh, creativity itself. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the products that come out of this kind of cross-pollination. Uh, we were talking earlier about how um, it's not just about having new technology and new innovation and new things, it's also combining an aesthetic to them. For example, the iPhone is pleasing to use, pleasing to touch, and it, yeah. it's a high-tech Absolutely. device. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things that fascinates me is when it comes to creating very new things that people have never seen before, one of the most important aspects of the created thing is, is its aesthetic value. When we see something that we've never experienced before, there's every reason to be skeptical and to not engage. Uh, what creators like Steve Jobs, for sure, uh, when he led Apple, uh, do in uh, seducing really the public to engage in very new uh, experiences is they create an attractiveness that sort of transcends the utility. And uh, that role of art, if I can use that word, in facilitating a conversation about the future is fundamental to a living culture. Uh, so we see it for sure in, in technology, but we see it also in uh, the dissemination of very new ideas that they're presented in very aesthetic ways that uh, start a conversation that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't uh, otherwise happen. Speaking of new ideas that start conversations and the aestheticness of it, you have a number of things that you have developed that definitely, when you read them on paper, you're like, I wonder how this works, and you have somehow been able to make it work. For example, the breathable chocolate and the, the O-Note. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the O-Note, what it does, and why Yeah, it's so I've been really interested since my first company related to inhaled insulin in delivering health and wellness through the air. There's really no medium that touches our body and our biology more than the air. And so this notion of being able to make every breath beneficial to our health uh, beyond the oxygen that we uh, inspire really um, inspires me. I've started several companies and not-for-profits uh, related to delivery of health through the air from insulin to uh, vaccines like TB. 
my latest company, which relates to uh, the digitization of scent, and it's called O Notes, is kind of the extrapolation of all of those uh, different companies. And uh, it is connected to this frontier of biology today, uh, related to olfactory receptors. It turns out that olfactory receptors, which are the molecules or the receptors in our nose that bind to uh, scented molecules and give us the perception of scent, are distributed throughout our body. The largest subclass of the human genome is the olfactory receptor subclass. And so biology is beginning to understand that the regulation of our bodies metabol m metabolically and neurologically is fundamentally shaped by olfactory receptors. And with that in mind, I was really intrigued with the possibility of digitizing this third dimension to communications. There are three senses that are mediated through the air. Light, sound, with three vectors, light, sound, and scent. Two of those are forms of energy, light and sound, and scent is a form of mass. And so it's been very difficult to digitize to date. People have thought about digitization and tried it sort of um, in many very funny experiences. Uh, but because scent diffuses and lingers and sticks, it's been a noisy signal and has not really been successful. So what do we do? So we've created a system that we call O-Notes, which is a, an electronic platform. Right now it's an app for iOS and Android, which functions like an iTunes of scent. Uh, so you can uh, download it for free and you can see playlists of scent and you can play those playlists and they will play on a scent speaker that we call Cyrano. It's had different names as we've been evolving it with the public over the last three years. And it uh, delivers signals of scent. And they're very subtle because scent is mass. You don't want to put very much in the air. It turns out that, well, uh, there's about 20% of people at any given moment that cannot perceive scent whether it's a cold or Alzheimer's. And, um, and yet, we find that it, when we do neurological imaging of uh, uh, those who can't consciously perceive scent, there's activity. So actually, it, and, and, and in the end, it takes very little scent to provoke our, our brains. And so we create these scent signals with this special uh, device called, uh, called Cyrano. And how does it work? So we have a kind of an ink cartridge for scent that goes into it, uh, uh, called an O-Note uh, uh, disc. And it carries a handful, 8, 10, 12 of scents that then can mix in over 100 different ways and create um, a range of, of scents that are connected to that family. It's very funny because we began thinking that we'd want to create thousands, even hundreds of thousands of scent. But scent is very segmenting. Some people love some scents and do not love other scents. And, and when people don't like scents, they really don't like scents. So we've really moved to a more cohesive uh, set of families of scent. And uh, the last thing just to say about that is that we have been exploring how would consumers today engage with digital scent, knowing that ultimately the value is for digital health, mm -hmm. actually, and for regulating neuro our brains and our, um, and our uh, metabolism. And so what people have gravitated towards is using this platform for enhancing performance. Uh, and so they use it in the car, at home, and in the office, and increasingly in the office. And so we're exploring how it can be used to address some of the major challenges of worker wellness, uh, where people are designing their workspace with this uh, digitization of scent. That's interesting because that, that was going to be my next question on um, how, how easy was it to market these kind of things. The, the, the um, breathable insulin seems like it would be something that people would want in vaccines because they don't like needles. So this was an easier solution, easier sell, but the, the sense seemed yeah, a little bit different. You know, so th this gets back to the beauty issue, right? And so the, when you're, so we understand that for, so just to be uh, clear again, that there's one out of all of our senses, there's only one sense that is uh, mediated directly from signal to the brain, and that's the sense of scent. Uh, 
through our olfactory nerve, the signal of scent goes to our emotive brain, to the hippocampus. And so we sort of feel, sense, scent before we cognitively process it. So scent has a major impact on our uh, physiology and on our emotions and on our memory. So we understand from a health and a, even an entertainment and, and a storytelling point of view, there's a lot of value to it. But why should consumers engage in it when they've not engaged in it before? And so what's key is to create an experience that's so seductive for certain consumers that they um, become first adopters. And so we've spent the last couple years understanding who those consumers are. And, um, and uh, they're millennials, actually, and they tend to be uh, urban dwelling millennials who uh, are uh, challenged to manage uh, really three things. One is their stress. Uh, two is their relaxation. And, and three is their ability just to, to get away, actually. And so scent um, is finding its home in this sort of seductive zone of uh, human wellness. Yeah, that makes sense, and it kind of also makes sense that um, that kind with the stress level and and um, the need to get away also plays a role with our society and how things how fast things are changing. Mm -hmm. And do you find that because things are changing so quickly with technology that this emergence of science and art is coming is emerging faster? That's a really good question. Uh, so, <clears throat> as I'll talk later on today. We have been so successful in our um, creativity and our innovation over the last years that we now live in a world that has in many ways become a kind of laboratory where not only are we as creators creating in labs, but consumers and people generally are increasingly living inside our labs and so participating in this experimental process. So the frontier conditions that we all emerged out of um, are increasingly the conditions that we're all living in, where each day is different and, and uh, this importance of being both a cognitive, analytical, problem-solving human being and also imaginative, comfortable with uncertainty, and inductive uh, human being is increasing not only in our companies and in our universities, but also in the street. So the, uh, yeah, the, the, I'm fascinated not only by the role of this merger of art and science in education at a, an institution like Kaust, uh, not only in a company like uh, an Apple, but also uh, in in culture in general. And so if you look at what's happening in culture, whether it's music or television or on the internet, you find that those nice, easy divisions that we had not too long ago are kind of going away. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the artist and the scientist, if you look at kind of what becomes popular in culture, lots of nerdy kind of things that used to be uh, much more French and are kind of a, this blend of art and science, um, it's becoming uh, more mainstream. Do you think the, the, the pace of our life and the amount of change that we have has, has helped enable this? For example, we kind of now look forward to having the next rendition of the iPhone people are kind of almost marketed to accept that change is going to happen and it's kind of cool to get the first of it. Yeah, that's, so that's interesting. I think there's two things happening there, um, one of which is, uh, I think, very positive and the other uh, is, is maybe less positive. I think that what's critical and, and is absolutely happening, I talk in my new book about this grassroots creator movement, which is the most important creative phenomenon of our time, literally billions on the planet now are creating things that last. Much of it is related to uh, user-generated content, but there's a massive uh, creative expressive movement that like, has no precedent in human history. This 
expressive and enjoying this expressive uh, um, kind of uh, activity um, adapts itself really well to new circumstances and so we kind of find pleasure in new circumstances and expressing our thoughts of those new circumstances and learning and so that's really positive uh, maybe less positive is that the um, ability of um, marketing to guide us towards um, hopes and desires and needs that we might not otherwise have um, uh, is, is, is also great. And so there's quite a competition going on, I believe, really fundamentally, that we're at the dawn of a new renaissance, what I think of as a grassroots renaissance. But as in all renaissances, there's a, an emergence of a new um, way of living and a uh, transition from an older way of living. And uh, those two are uh, in, uh, in competition right now. And uh, it'll be um, fun to watch how it plays out. Okay. One last question for me before we take um, questions from the audience. We talked a little bit about how large cities are able to have this cross-pollination of art and science. Can there be micro-communities? Can this cross-pollination happen organically within a lab or within a company Absolutely. or within a business? Yeah, that's again a fabulous question. So again in my book, I talk a lot about this notion of a culture lab. Uh, so I pointed out this analogy of us all kind of living in a lab. And uh, if you look at the ability of the 20th century to radically change how we live, it has a lot to do with this notion of a translational lab and you know as you know we put we invest now two to four percent of gdp in experimental research through translational labs in developed countries and so there's this um model of a lab which has been very successful in um in in bringing innovation into our lives so the this this phenomenon of the grassroots creator movement is accompanied by this uh model which i call a culture lab which is a, an environment, it's a micro environment. It can be a home, in a home, it could be in a classroom, it can be in a company. You know, at one level it can be all of Silicon Valley, but it's an environment which is uh, promoting three things. Ideation, experimentation, and exhibition. These three things are related to the reward system of our brains. It turns out that creating kind of as we talk in from a neuroscience point of view wanting reinforcement learning and liking which is kind of related to ideating experimenting and exhibiting is fun and in in many ways our biology has made it fun because it helps us survive and uh, so these labs encourage that um, ideation, experimentation, and exhibition, and provide audiences for that, as parents do for kids who are curious and are wanting to kind of express themselves. And so making those culture labs in more sophisticated ways in our schools, in our companies, um, and in our not-for-profits is a, is a real priority. And the last thing I want to say is that it is happening organically as p more and more people are creating these kinds of self-associations in these sort of culture labs, which may last for a weekend, they may last for a week. Uh, there are these really interesting kind of creator um, phenomena that are happening around food, that are happening around electronics and robots, that are happening around ceramics, are all um, uh, illustrative of the kind of um, infrastructure we can bring into an institution like this to really transform its culture. That's interesting. And it's good to hear that it can happen even in a home. I didn't think about how it can really work with um, children and families. Absolutely. It's very interesting. So I'm going to open it up to the audience. See if anyone has any questions. I'll start it up with one question. Um, so far you've talked about trends in the cross-pollination of art and science, but primarily within a high-tech, um, cutting-edge, Silicon Valley, westernized sort of environment. Um, I'm wondering if you, I mean, if you, if you can take a broader look around the world, um, mostly in the developing world, and are there are there trends within that sort of intersection between art and science that you see at a 
perhaps a, a less technologically cutting edge sort of stage. Absolutely. In fact, thank you. Uh, I have not said very much about this grassroots creative movement. Um, it's extremely artisanal. It, uh, it's true that we kind of associate it with robotics competitions and things like that, but the, the, when we talk about a billion or more grassroots creators, these are very uh, simple kinds of uh, creative activities that are happening right now. And one of the things that we see um, in um, both the developed and the developing world, largely related to the um, existence of the internet, is this um, uh, ability, uh, sometimes through online uh, kinds of communities, um, but not always, to create um, these uh, local maker uh, um, uh, uh, communities. Um, I distinguish between the maker movement, which is often related to uh, uh, physical things, from the grassroots creator movement, which includes um, virtual and, and, uh, and, uh, and material uh, content. And so this is trans transcending um, uh, developed and developing world and, and as you know uh, right now particularly in Africa there's quite a movement uh, towards um, uh, grassroots creation and uh, and um, um, and, uh, and and the ultimately the learning uh, one thing I, I point out in my book is that these environments the importance of these environments goes beyond what we make to what we learn through what we make and I point to seven cognitive and emotive dimensions that young people and all of us learn through these kinds of activities and just to quickly go through them they relate to passionate curiosity and so things that people do that build this passion which is critical to survival really empathy uh, there's really nothing more important to your survival at a frontier than to have somebody next to you who puts themselves in your shoes. Um, nothing more important for a pioneer than to buddy up. Intuition, um, calling on this amazing bank of unconscious knowledge which is uh, critical to um, innovation. Innocence, which we think of as a big kind of negative, but in fact if you look at all of this kind of grassroots work that's going on and, and, and generally in the lives of pioneers, they're often putting themselves into new circumstances where they're quite naive uh, because they learn most then actually their intuition works for them. Humility, uh, something I call aesthetic intelligence. So the great thing about all of this grassroots creative movement is that we're kind of making things that express what we care about and we kind of have a need to put them in a form that others care about. And so we kind of pay attention to uh, our language. And the last thing is obsession. So this, I, actually writing in yesterday from the airport, I had one of the participants here at the uh, enrichment program, and we got to talking about creativity. And he works for a oil company, an um, uh, international oil company. And he's a grassroots creator. He said, you know, I go home every night and I make these uh, in his case, electronic, uh, and he said they don't really serve any purpose actually, and and I kind of make them sometimes with my my daughter, um, and um, but I kind of do that, and uh, and sometimes I bring it to work, and, and my boss is like not always super happy about that, and we got into this conversation about how this grassroots creator, and, and he was pointing out that actually, what I find is that, however, if I make the idea and then bring it to my boss. He's much more receptive than if I just bring the idea to, himself, to himself. So all of which is to say, I think that the real heart of this art and science merger and this sort of free-spirited creative movement is, is not in our sophisticated labs. It's not in our sophisticated universities. It's really in homes and in individual lives around the world. And it's coming back into, you know, if I look at Harvard University, when I came to Harvard University, you know, 2001, talk about making immediately put you in an applied school. You couldn't be on the main campus. Making was, like, had nothing to do with the general education. 
Um, and so I had to invent a new language to talk about what I did so that it kind of felt like it belonged in the university. Uh, now, it's a completely different place. And so making is happening all over the university. And what's, what is the catalyst for change? It's not, if I can say so, my colleagues. And I'm probably not the administration either. It's really the young people who are coming into our classrooms and they don't really care about what we have to say in principle. Uh, they know that there's knowledge throughout and they're kind of making their own future and they're asking us to engage with them uh, where they are. So I think the power, uh, even though it can seem like it's in the hands of an Elon Musk or it can seem as if it's in the hands of um, uh, power, for lack of a better word, is really in the hands of, uh, of, uh, of us all, which is uh, exciting. That is interesting. All of your traits that you mentioned are available in anybody without, they don't have to have an education to have an obsession or innocence. Absolutely. Or one, one of the things, just to, you know, it's funny how we think, and I thought when I went to school that, you know, you couldn't really do anything until you had calculus and you had gone through all of these different stages. Well, increasingly, we understand that, you know, um, the less you know, often the better. Uh, off you are. There's a book that uh, was published a couple years ago called Ignorance, which uh, was written by the uh, head of the biology department at Columbia University. And the whole point of the book is that, you know, we think about science and scientists as, as kind of this, the generators of knowledge, and they're all about knowledge. But it's really, scientists are all about ignorance, actually. Every discovery, we, every discovery we make raises 10 more questions than the, it answers. And it, it, um, it, it is also true when you get scientists together, they're not talking about what they know, they're talking about what they don't know. And so there's this real power in not knowing, which, um, which is a great thing. I wish I had known when I went to school that um, what I was bringing into school in my um, intuitive bank of, uh, of knowledge was much, much, much more precious than what I would learn uh, 20 years later after having been in school. But I think we're more aware of that now uh, um, uh, because of all of these uh, grassroots phenomena. That was going to lead to my next question because uh, the more it seems like the longer you're in school, the longer you are in a corporate environment, the longer you are in the old world thinking society, the more of those seven traits kind of get repressed. Can people bring them out? Yeah, that's oh, absolutely. So I think the um, so d d just to wind back here a, a second, just to realize that our biology has evolved over the course of human history, mostly in pioneering, edgy, uncertain circumstances. And so we have all of that working for us. And so it's true that some environments, some learning environments and working environments, less today, but still many, um, dissuade that and kind of push us to a more mindless kind of um, uh, life, if you think there's no more mindful life than the life of the pioneer who wakes up at the frontier and can't really figure out which way is north and which way is south. Uh, well, hopefully you can figure out that, but, but it nevertheless can't know much. Um, that's really where we, you know, we, we, our biology has come through that. And so the, the uh, secret to reestablishing this, this uh, kind of natural regulation with our environment is, is related to these microenvironments that we were talking about. You know, and it, it's pretty basic. We, it, it, we're talking about um, mentors and leaders who are able to encourage dream. Uh, we're talking about environments that actually tolerate failure and uh, that encourage expression. Uh, we, we're talking about environments that not only uh, promote this dream and experimentation expression, but also help connect that expression to uh, <coughs> larger and larger communities. Um, if you think about just raising a child and what happens is that child eventually goes on and becomes independent, hopefully, of, of uh, her parents and, and uh, goes on to live an independent life. There's this gradual onion-like expansion of, of her dream space. And that's what we need, uh, these kind of environments that allow uh, individuals to, um, to both uh, express their 
personal experience, which is so valuable. I mean, I, I tell my students uh, when they come into my class, I teach a class called How to Create Things and Have Them Matter, and my students often, when they, I encourage them to come up with ideas, they always say, well, I, I found that idea on the internet. I, it's, it's like it's already been had, and my point to them always is that, well, if you had that idea independently, you at 17 years of age or 18 years of age, um, it's, it's new. It's new because it's rooted in your experience. And if you just ignore what other people have said long enough and figure out what do you really mean by that, how does it, ma why does it matter to you? Um, eventually, it's unique. And even if it looks like it kind of has been imagined before, it really has not. So there's something magical in all of us which relates to when we were born, how we were raised, and our moment in space and time that, is, uh, that makes us valuable to a company to a university, to a country. And uh, so it create environments that bring that out, but also help that individual recognize that nevertheless, that may matter to me, but it may not matter to anybody else. And so there's this importance of all of us to at some point look around and say, well, what do you care about? And, and this, this thing that happens, and you see it with children actually, as they sort of become less and less about the parents and more and more about their kind of environment, as they sort of absorb uh, the world around them, uh, that's a good thing, you know, and that's what kind of makes uh, for society. And um, so anyway, that process uh, is, is natural, and, um, and we can all, no matter what our age, uh, um, go back into it and have a lot of fun. And take any more questions from the audience if we have any? No? Okay, well, there's no questions from the audience, and I've already taken up uh, 40 minutes of your time. Thank you very much. And for those of you who want to tune in, at 1230, we'll be live streaming his presentation. It's Art, Science, and the Invention of Things at Last. It, it will be on our YouTube station and also on our Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.